What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another Art of War strategy session. I am your host, Nick Nalavati, and today we're going to try another coaching match recap. So we did this last week and had a lot of positive feedback, a lot of awesome comments on the YouTube video and in the, our Discord server. So thank you so much for the feedback. Um, we we're definitely going to try to, in the future, get more than one person's perspective on this. Um, trying it out as a little trial, trial and error right now, figure out how we want to approach this. But uh, your feedback means the world to us. So what we're going to do today is basically take a game I played a little while ago with my Thousand Sons versus my town. The cool thing about this Thousand Sons list is you can actually go back a few strategy sessions to uh, the one titled Nick Nonavati's List Building Philosophy. And it's a two-part of that one and then the follow-up revising your army list. And that basically, in real time, walks you through how I create this Thousand Sons list that I'm playing with today. And then use it on the table and then uh, if you go back and kind of watch part two it'll all kind of come together so definitely if you want like the full picture and full package of this strategy session that that's where you can kind of get the behind the scenes of how this army came to be and my vision for how it plays on the tabletop so today we're going to go through uh, a game i played against richard Caesar with this thousand sons list um against his tau in recover the relics and it's got some interesting notes from a strategic level this is a very high level strategic game um, whereas my last game uh, that I did a coaching match re recap on was against was my Death Guard versus John's Tears. I would say that was a much more tactical game. A lot of combat pylons and minutia. This game is a lot about screening and a lot about proficiency on that end. And then also a, a big scale macro picture and points projections and all that. So I'm very excited to get into it. Uh, please let me know what you think in the comments. Like this video, subscribe to our channel, it would really help us out. And please, yeah, tag me in the Discord server if you have any questions, any thoughts, any feedback you want to give me. Uh, in the future, we'll try to get other players on for these strategy sessions as well, if that's something you want to see. Um, any format suggestions, you know, also open to that. So without further ado, kind of going right into it. I've got my list here, just recapping. We are playing Cult of Mutation. We have an Exalted Sorcerer on a disc. We've referred to Temporal Surge or Ahadi to cast three powers. Um... And an Infernal Master with Temporal Manipulation, Malefic Maelstrom, Glories of Eternity. Normal stuff right there. Three units of five rubrics with buff powers. Unit of ten Scarab Occult Terminators with Soul Reapers, Hellfire Axe, and Empiric Guidance. Nice big strong unit. Zingor Shaman with Doombolt to help me out with Psychic Actions. And Line of Sight with uh, Cabals. Big boy on campus, Magnus the Red. He's of course the Warlord and knows all the Psychic Powers. Uh, and then a Demon Patrol with Fate Weaver, Ten Pink Cars, and Three Flamers. So the basic premise of this list is I do all of the mortal wounds with Fate Weaver and Magnus and just Thousand Sons. Like it, this is this army pumps out like twenty plus mortal wounds on average without trying. Um, I am playing against Richard Ziegler's house. So before I set the stage too much, I'll just kind of go through that. So we've got the commander in Cold Star suit, uh, another commander in Crisis suit. With they've got a lot of towers, Seeker protection, Overdrive power systems, DW two advanced burst cannon. I mean, you could read the list. <laughs> it's tile stuff. Uh, this is where like, the, uh, the having Richard's perspective can definitely be a, a value add to these types of videos. So two commanders. One's got Cyclic's Missile Pod Flamer. One's got Missile Pod Burst Plasma. One's a Gold Star. One's a regular. Crew Shaper with the 12-inch No Deep Strike Aura. That's very relevant in this matchup. Two units of 10 Breachers. A unit of five Crisis Suits, Plasma, Cyclic, and Missile Pod. Um, they've got a couple of drones and the female pain guy, two units of four crew towns, three riptides, all featuring ion cannons and plasma rifles. Uh, he actually noted he wanted to include one burst cannon after this game, but, um, didn't make that change just yet. And of course, two devilfish. Now, I believe Richard actually made some slight adjustments to his list actually played as opposed to the list that's on, on this, um, graphic right here. But more or less, this is what I was playing against. So we can kind of work from that. So this is the mission we're playing, Recover the Relics. So I'll just draw out our deployment zones here and kind of go through our plans and our second... Oh, that's big. That's big. Let's make that smaller. How's that? That seems like a better line size. So these are roughly our deployments. They don't quite make the objective, unfortunately, on the other side. And in this mission... You only score command points in your command phase if you control an objective in your command phase in no man's land. So no one's actually going to start with command points. Oh, wait, Richard Scat moves with his little crude shaper, these crude hounds, if they want. And I believe there's some crude, crude shaper hound action over here as well. So he's got a lot of ability to scout move and 
get those uh, command points. So starting it out with my secondaries and Richard's secondaries over here, uh, I have Shasso Sieglers on the, on the blue side and I am on the red side, easy enough to tell. So Richard went for raise the banners. It's a very good mission for banners here. You can passively sit on your side and pretty much if she can raise banners, turn one, score 15 points on banners until someone comes over and tears them down. So that's good on Richard's side. And you'll see I also took raise the banners. Uh, Richard's gone for decisive action, which is controlling at least half the objectives on the table at the end of your turn, turns three, four, and five, because he goes for Kalyan, of course. So one, two, three, at least half, pretty easy, doable for a 12. And then grind them down, which is about killing more units. I'm sorry, he's gone for a boy the witch. A boy the witch is two points for every psycho unit he kills. So my thousand sons in here, and three points for the characters Magnus, Fate Weaver, and say a shaman or something. And then he's gone for grind them down. Sorry, I've gone for grind them down, uh, which is about killing more um, enemy units in the battle round than they kill of mine. So I'm trying to really hit it for his one to zero as many times as I can over here with my army. And then Warp Ritual, um, that's really easy for Thousand Suns. It's basically free. Um, we mark the center point. We measure six inches out to right around here, give or take. We send some character in, and then we warp time him right back. Or we, uh, if we were playing Cult of Duplicity, we could teleport him back. But in this case, we're going to go for warp time. And in, in any case, you'll see how that pans out. So that's kind of our general plan. Um, and in this one, I end up going first, which is a bit unfortunate. So let's go through our deployment. Uh, I have this nice big line of sight blocking piece of terrain, so does Richard. Uh, he's put his Devilfish with Pathfinders, there's Pathfinders, not Breachers in this version, uh, in this one. Perfectly fine choice. Um, his Crisis Suits are here, easy stage. I'm not really able to get line of sight to him. Um, he knows at this point that I've, I've deployed Magnus and Fate Weaver in reserve, which is, you can see that, he's, they're not on the table. Um, so he's been pretty aggressive and he centered his army pretty much on this flank. And I think the reason he went for that is because if you move down this angle and eventually take this side, you can see into my ruins here and here. And that's that's like a how to kind of think approach. And as Richard can of course speak to, to that better than I can, but um, essentially the further down he goes, the more line of sight he's gonna get into my castle and take those spots away from me. And if I'm only ever safe on my deep, deep home field, which this art of war terrain creates here, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not dying, but I'm not really playing 40k. I'm not scoring points aside from the one objective that I'm on. So Richard's plan is essentially to force his way down the side, take away this objective, which is pretty easy to attack in comparison to the other, because what Richard can do is just move up here, tad this ruin. It's got windows everywhere, and then see down this back end, which is where I want to stage something like my flamers or some rubric marines for the future. If we were to try to approach this attack on the other side, um, say, move up here, tag the ruin, we're eventually gonna see here, get stuck by this wall, and line of sight ends. So we're taking away this area that is the dice tray, unfortunately, we didn't get a better shot of that. Um, but there's basically nothing here. It's, it's identical to this corner here, so there's like essentially a little foresty crater thing. So, I have no incentive to ever be there, so he's getting a really great line of sight angle to a spot I don't want to be. Like cutting this angle here doesn't do much. I'm never going to be there. And then if you actually try to attack my staging points, it's much harder, and I can effectively hold this objective um, from behind the wall. So basically, by choosing to deploy heavily on one flank, and making this flank, Richard can make the plane come down here, see into this, you know, really cut the angles that I'm allowed to hide my army right off the bat. And then in future turns, come to here. Let me uh, erase that one real quick. In future turns, yeah, he can also cut this angle here on his first turn. And then in future turns, he can come down here and then really start to take away my hiding spots. On the opposite side, it just wouldn't work. And if you go dead central, uh, and just continue to get pushed from here, it's fine. He's kind of doing with the crisis suits, but eventually 
you're stunted because I have this objective control and I have this objective control and you never get into this thing by brute forcing your way through. So nice, nice deployment by Richard picking a side, picking the right side and just going for it. I deployed pretty much my army here, Terminators, Rubrics, Characters, 10 pink cars here. Uh, and I basically checked angles, so like the only thing Richard could realistically do is take his Riptide, come here, tie the terrain, shoot my pink horrors like that, which would actually cause me to multiply. And then I'd put a couple horrors over here, potentially out of line of sight from whatever his angles and his movement phase are. And then I actually gain a command point in my second turn, should I go second. Because right now I'm not gaining any in the, until I move. Okay, so now that we've gone through deployment and secondaries, let's talk about tempo and timing and victory. So, turn one. I went first. And as you can see, Richard is scout moved his crit moves here, his crit shaper here, and a little crit shaper here. And this one down here in the corner, I believe, is the one with the EM scrambler. So, this is the 12 inch aura of Noah Deep Strike on that guy. So, what, let's analyze the situation from a game theory perspective. I've put Magnus and Fate Weaver into reserve. This is my plan. I'll go through it in great detail in my list construction videos in the other two strategy sessions. And basically, what I'm trying to do is take a couple turns off the game and then turn three, um, based on what Richard allows Deep Strike Fate Weaver in, Deep Strike Magnus in, and teleport the Terminators all the way up the table with the Umberlific Crystal. Try to hit maybe a nine inch charge with somebody, really lay in the mortal wounds and put a threat overload in his face where from that position I can really go to town uh, because he's not able to kill all of that in one turn, especially when the mortals start raining. So I'm looking to take the first couple turns off and that is my mechanism for which I will score, will grind them down, warp ritual and raise banners. So grind them down, if I'm not really participating in any meaningful way, then I'm not really gonna score kills, but Richard's, um, Richard's not either. Now Richard's incentivized the screen because I have so much stuff in reserve that's very potent and it can come in either turn two or turn three, especially when I go first. So these crude hounds, if they want to expose themselves to be a little bit more of an effective screen, that means I can then kill them and retreat to safety with warp time and the psychic base to get my grind them down on such a small unit, four wounds in the crude hound squad, uh, four wounds or three wounds even on the shape, but I'm not even sure. So two wounds on Dronian. So anything Richard wants to screen can be an easy grind down feed point. So I'm kind of forcing him to this trade of like, he screens, I smite, I get grind. He doesn't screen, I get Magnus where I want in his face. So that's kind of the delicate balance. Now going first sucks here because I want to play control style match, reduce the number of turns and play the end half of the game. Um, and with that in mind, um, Richard going second means he's got more control on primary. So I have to keep that in the back of my mind while doing these points projections. And as well, Richard's army took Kao Yan. So the longer and longer I wait to fight it, the better and better it gets. Turns three gets exploding sixes, the units within 12, closest unit within 12. So that's gonna be a key different mistake I made. Um, it's gonna be uh, exploding fives on turn five or four and exploding sixes on turn five. So you really don't want any of that happening to you. Okay, so turn one, Basically, this is what I'm thinking. Take these three flamers, put them here, raise a banner. That's what this little poker chip is right there, and right here, and right here. Um, these horrors just moved up and raised a banner. My castle pretty much sat right here. You can see my Zangor Shaman. Um, he is right here. And basically what he did was... So one CP switches power to warp time. I believe he switched to a smite to warp time. Blue to the middle, Richard has no denies. You can see that die marks six inches for, the mark, that die marks the center, so I know where warp ritual is and where I have to be. Move up there, cast warp ritual, switch to warp time, cast, spend a CP to cast the power and action, and then warp time right back to there. Bada bing, bada boom. Actually, don't think that's what I did. My apologies. I don't, uh, what I did, I think that's not actually how Thousand Suns combo, but in any case, same thing. I, I moved out six inches to right here. I moved out 12 inches like that, got Warp Ritual off. This guy, my good old fashioned exalted sorcerer, someone in here with Warp Time, he extended his range with Cabal points to get barely within 12 inches just like that, and that Warp Time came backwards. So that's that's a legal way of doing the maneuver I just said. But in essence, there's Thousand Suns of like a variety of different paths to move a model in the psychic phase. So you get out here, and you go over there, and that's the plan. 
So the other thought I had with all this is that this, this Riptide comes up, and of course, if he shoots those horrors, I multiply on this objective, it's not a big deal. If he shoots these flamers, one Riptide really shouldn't kill three flamers, and no one else can get line of sight to it. So I shouldn't, um, I'm not getting grind this turn, I haven't killed anybody, but I shouldn't be giving up the kill point. I should be able to hold my eight and keep my banner up. So with that, we go to Richard's turn. He spends a great deal of time measuring, thinking, and again, Richard's thoughts here would be excellent. Um, basically, he's trying to, in this instance, block out my Psychic Ritual as easy as possible. So this is my six-inch aura that he's measured here with his croutons. So I can't land with an inch of the model, so I'd have to pass them, which means if I go 12 inches backwards, I end up on the wrong side of this ruin. Very clever play. If I go here, I end up on the halfway through the ruin wall, so I can't actually warp ritual this turn um, without getting creative in some capacity, or at least that's what he's going for. Uh, he's also set it up so he's got an, an attached two-man drone unit right here. Oops, boop, so these are two solo drone, two a two-man unit of drones to basically replace this crewtown screen in the next turn. And this crewtown unit right now is pushing back all of my reserves. So like there, well, I'll try to, you, know, you can imagine nine inches off these guys in like an aura. This Riptide didn't actually touch this terrain feature. Very, very deliberate of Richard here. So he's trying to be out of line of sight. So if I'm just a, and he's projecting a nine inch aura of the Deep Strikes himself, basically to the end of the board. So now there's nowhere I can realistically land um, Magnus and Fate Weaver here. And again, there's a Kroot Shaper here that's just hiding. So if we look at my options for Deep Strike, and I'll, I'm going to put these in blue so we can better see. I can come in in my Ruin, not really see anything besides Kroot Hounds from that spot. I can come in back here, not really see anything besides Kroot Hounds, not arranged anything besides Kroot Hounds. Come back in my own Deployment Zone. It's pretty lame. And I can come back over here, and that's why I can't see this Riptide. So that's where it's almost bait. Like if Richard came up to get line of sight with those Riptides onto my Flamers and my Horrors, he would be in a bad position because I would have something nice to chew on in my turn. But now, the way Richard, Richard screened out effectively, I can essentially kill a Crudetown unit and get, interact with nothing else this turn with my Reserves. Um, Scoreboard-wise, not much is happening. Uh, I score an 8 here. Richard's on the same number of objectives as me. That'll get marked in just a minute, I'm sure. Uh, I got 3 Orb Rituals turn 1. I get 3 banners at the top of my turn. Richard hasn't killed anything. The decisive action is later, and he's raised his banners. You can see that is the, the green blips on these objectives. And I'm sure there's one here as well. Okay, so let's keep it going. On to turn 2. I decide to rebuttal this by do a real do nothing turn. Real do nothing. So I can't actually get this warp ritual and return to safety play without. Um, well, I can't really do it because those crew towns. So I essentially came out, smited the crew towns out, went right back to safety. Very, very little did nothing. And a large part of that was because of Richard's screening. I also used the cult of mutation power, doo -doo 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 -doo, which is why I play cult of mutation. To slow down the enemy. So I hit these, this two-man drone unit here. And what the Cult of Mutation power is going to do is essentially make it so that I target this terrain feature within 24 inches. It doesn't even have to be visible. So I actually think I use this Shaman to do it. He's still hanging out over there. So the play looks something like this. This Shaman targets this terrain feature. Pick a unit within three inches of that terrain feature. These two drones right here. Bing, bing. Those two drones have move minus one advance, minus one charge next turn. So instead of moving 10, or is it 8? I forget. And then advancing and sh advancing to like over here, and then pretty much recreating that same area my crew hounds were doing, they're going to move 4 and then advance slower, and pretty much be here, which is not going to totally screw off Warp Ritual, and it does take some inches off of the screen. Now some plays I did look at doing were something like, move the Zangor Shaman forward, move the Zangor Shaman forward to here, and now I can see these two drones, so he could smite them out like that, and then I could use the spell to maybe slow down this Crisis unit. Um, that would trade my Zangor Shaman, which would give th Richard three aboard the Witch Points, which he's currently at zero, and that would also give Richard the ability to deny grinding down, because I kill 
the crude hounds. And maybe I kill the drones, but it's possible I don't kill the drones. And then I've lost the shaman. So it's, it's a risk because I'm basically just doing a smite. Now I could three flat on the smite and pretty much guarantee the drone kill. But it's basically, I give Richard three aboard the witch points and I lose a character who's a really good resource. Uh, we'll see if this screws me over, but this was the, definitely something I considered. Um, in the thing. It's also CP and resource intensive to, to pull off this play. And once the Zangor Shaman is dead, I don't have a good person to do ritual and come back because my other casters want to all be involved actually casting their powers, not doing warp ritual. So, Richard's turn two. He spends a great deal of time positioning and thinking about it. I'll summarize what happened here. He just moved his crude hound shaper that way. His Delphish kind of puts itself in park over there. The two druids, ah, lo and behold, despite moving slowly, they still get to there. Um, he brings his lonely crude shaper out to here. And as you can see, we've and he's kept the same tight perimeter. Everybody's out of line of sight from all the angles I can realistically drop in, or at least as best as he can do. Crisis units out. Riptide not really in that angle there. Behind, Riptide not touching terrain here. So, thankfully, um, Richard and I are cooperative people. This is highly, I encourage you to play 40k in your own time. We marked out all the different spots that I could deep strike into based on the positioning of Richard's models. So we know those are my options, and we know going into my turn three, I have to show up. So I, can sh I can't stall forever because Magnus and uh, Fate Weaver are big models that will eventually give up aboard the Witch Points. Because what I'm doing right now, if we take a second and look back at the scoreboard real quick, um, is essentially I have top of turn, but in the control match setting, I have one kill, I have this eight. I'm going to sit here and score eights forever until Richard comes and contests it. So, realistically, the longer we sit here and do the screen, grind them down, I get a kill tree instead of and do nothing. I'm basically getting myself up to, let's see if I can write, oh boy, 32 primary on these ones. There's no drawing. That's okay. 32 primary over here. That's not bad, right? 32 primary. It's kind of bad. Um, well, if we killed the crew on turn two, if he gives me the two drones on turn three, we'll get two mission points. So we'll put, put that in as a two. It's not a two. Um, boop, 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 two. And 32 on primary. Secondaries down here. Well, if I just continue holding my banners indefinitely, that's a 15 until Richard exposes himself and really comes and takes down my banner. Or ritual, I'm sure I can manufacture a 12 by playing Thousand Suns. I've already got a three. Grind them down even if I only get a six because Richard screens for two turns. Let's do that math. So that has my score projected out at. This is literally, I do this in tournaments. 32, 34, 40, 55, 67, 77 with paint. And then we look at Richard, who's also going to score eights the entire time. So his 32 is actually a 36 because um, he has bottom of turn. We're going to give him four bonus points for bottom of turn. And eventually he's going to kill these flamers. Unless I run away with them, so that could, but I can't run away with them because that gives him a 12. So eventually he's going to kill these flamers. Hopefully that doesn't grind, stop my grind. So he's going to get one mission point. His secondaries. Oh, there's got to be a better way to do this. I'm just erasing endlessly. You know, in, in high school, I always felt for my teachers how to do this. Okay, so in... His secondaries, he's going to banners up for 15 the same way I am, of course. Decisive action is a 12 because he's going to hold half the objectives three times during his side of the game. And the board, which is a zero, which is pretty good. So if we look at his points projection, 36, 37, plus 15 is 52, plus 12 is 64, plus 10 is 74. So in very, very, very... Theoretical type math. I win by three if I continue to just sit here for as long as I possibly can. 
The challenge here is eventually Magnus and Lord Change come in. And if Richard kills one of them at any point, that will probably mess with my grind them down math. And it will give him three more points on Warp Ritual, on uh, Aboard the Witch, as, as opposed to zero. If that Shaman goes out and trades right now, it probably washes even with the grind, but it gives him those three Aboard the Witch points. He needs to get a 77, and it makes my Warp Ritual harder. So that's why we didn't send the Shaman out in, my in this turn two. So Richard's turn, turn bottom of two. He just screens me out, knowing the timer is up. And Magnus and Fate Weaver have to come in. So even though I am winning this stalemate, my list design is actually of the assumption that I don't start by winning stalemates because Thousand Suns don't do that much anymore. I just happen to do it against Tau because Tau have terrible secondaries. So I'm not able to play the control game when I would want to versus the Tau army. I have to come in now. So let's see what that looks like. I've actually broken this down into two different, two different phases. This is going to be during reserves. This is me actually thinking through my reserves. So we kind of know where my options are. And what I'm thinking here is if I'm going for threat overload, I'm going for threat overload. Let's bring these pinks up and uh, they can try to start being a threat, start getting active. Let's bring some rubric marines up to replace where these pinks are on this objective. If Seeks has time to shoot these rubric marines in the future um, through Magnus, Lord Change, and Fate Weaver, he's either doing terrible target priority or I've won already or I've lost already because he's got through it all. So kind of threat overload, this is the turn to move if you're going to move, expose yourself, because now there's so many threats on the board. Same thing, Richard actually did kill my Flamers in his last turn, so he, he stopped me from scoring run down, so my math already is off and we're tied, set to tie at 74-74. Because I didn't get grind on the Crude Hounds, because I gave it up when he killed my Flamers that are no longer here. So I do need to hold this objective on the bottom right here. I kept my banner, which is great, but missed the grind. So, now we've got to come in. We brought our Shaman forward to get our Warp Ritual going. And I'm thinking about my options for attack here. And there's a lot of decision points in tempo. Because I can come in spread out over here and over here. I can come in in the middle. I can come in hard on one flank. And I actually end up bringing Magnus over here. You see, you're seeing a screenshot where Magnus is right here, but in the, in the game I actually played, and the next screenshot will show you. I actually changed my mind and moved him over here, which we'll get into in just a moment. So let's think about it. If I approach it from this side and try to take this flank, there's nothing to attack, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm fighting a Devilfish, I'm fighting a Crude Shaper, fighting two drones. I'm just kind of stuck, and it opens up the option for Seeks to really come hard this way and use his range as an advantage because all my stuff is 18 inches and I'm easily move blocked. I'm not easily move blocked. I fly and I move 12 to 16 inches, but my bases are big and fat. I, I have to clear a spot for me to land. So like Fate Weaver can only really land here, 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 or here within 12 inches. So like if two drones were to say put themselves, or maybe four crude hounds is a better example right here, now Fate Weaver is stuck on that though, this side of the crew towns, and it takes a huge chunk of base away from me. Very clever about that's a whole different thing for a ten minute tip. But I'm very easily move blocked by this, this caliber of play, so I don't really want to um, go hard during this side. Basically, kill what is sees is screening me that's just on the left, and then I created separation of distance of like fifty billion inches for myself. So that's why I was in this moment thinking I can threat overload here and really push into him but this is where i got stuck on magnus because there's only so much space i can actually put my models here and maybe he'd be better off in this spot or say this spot but we're in the spots that i was considering i was thinking my terminators are gonna move forward which they're doing right now they're gonna move forward again with warp time and they're gonna charge these drones so i don't have to waste smites on them i don't have to see them and I can get further up the table. And that's better than trying to duplicity into a spot that's kind of where I'm already moving to based on Richard's screens. So I can use that to be here. I'm trying to visualize where my turn will be. So I'm thinking if I have a Terminator wall here, maybe like, let me try to draw on that again. If I have a Terminator wall here, Fate Weaver right here is not going to die. Seize's natural response would be to create distance, basically kill my Terminators, boom, and start going this way, especially if Magnus is here, because then Magnus doesn't have much to attack. If Magnus was here, 
which is where I end up putting him. Then he can intercept the Crisis Suits and Terminators when they want to, where they want to move. It's basically kind of pincering scenes, forcing him to fight me, which is what I need to do because I'm, I have these, these big mountains of models, Magnus and Fate Weaver, that really want to come in and do as much damage as they can. So right now they can't do that much damage. But they want to um, basically mm, get in a position where next turn they can end the game. If, if they're still alive, if I have enough resources. So I spend my, well, now that we've kind of covered my thought processes with reserves, um, let's go to how my turn actually played out. Well, Richard, because he tagged this terrain feature with his Riptide, I was able to smite him back. And that was in an effort to kill my Flamers to deny my Grime down, but I did get him smited back. I got him shot by my Terminators. And all said and done, that Riptide went down to two mortals. And you might be thinking, wait, if the two wounds, if he is down to two wounds, why wouldn't you put Magnus here and just have him finish him out with his 18-inch uh, range spells? Well, the unfortunate reality is Richard is a clever, clever goose. And he has the 12-inch range of no deep strike here. And as you can see, that is my dice representing where I can go. And he pre-measured 18 inches, basically, to make it so Magnus couldn't be within 18 inches of the Riptide or Smites or anything of that nature. So I could use, I could have used um, Cabal Points to maybe have regular dudes smite the Crude Hound through over here, have Fate Weaver do that or something. But he's in a really tough angle to see. And then have Magnus super extend his smite into this Riptide and back it potentially with his Terminator shooting not kill him. But instead of going for that line, I went for the line of, of a more chess-based approach where it's instead of focusing on damage now, I'm focusing on positioning. So Magnus being here allows him to start interacting with this angle while Fate Weaver can interact with that angle. That's really what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to create interactions with Richard. So um, Terminators, like I said, moved up, charge those two drones, spread out just like where I wanted them. Um, big break on Terminators, Magnus over here. Uh, and, you know, that's pretty much it. So, scoring it out, Richard's basically and I are dead tied on the scoreboard because we're not able to make any meaningful impacts on the primary objectives on any flank or the banners. Even when Richard took me off with those flamers, he he riffed me to an egg. So that points projection that had us basically drawing nebulously is really going to come down to whether or not the banners or board the witches or grind them downs get disrupted. And my shaman uh, actually stayed in the middle here within three of this terminator. I don't want to say I figured that's a pretty safe spot for him to be honest. And I used warp time, of course, on the terminators to get them moving forward. So let's go to Richardson Four and see how he rebuts. Well, that sucks. Okay, we lost the terminators. That's big, real bad. Real bad. Big. Real bad. Big sad. So terminators dead. Uh, took most of his shooting phase, not all of his shooting phase. Positionally. Richard retreated with these Christ suits, basically moved to here, and then fire and fade them. I, so I put Cult of... Oh, this is more stuff I did in my previous turn. I had a complicated turn. Here I also put Cult of Mutation on the string feature on this Christ suit. So there, instead of moving 18 on a move 10 and advance 8, they are going to move um, 12 on a move 5, advance 7 situation. So... While it may not sound like much, 18 versus 12 in terms of inches is a big difference. So they basically moved out this way. And this was part of me trying to trap them in with Magnus. You know, if they don't move very far, it's a lot easier. So they moved this way, they shot these Terminators, and they fire and faded right back behind the wall. Ah, uh, strike and fade. So that's how they ended up over there. Riptide scooted out. Riptide scooted out, Riptide scooted out. The two and Riptide came back, so I could have killed him. Ooh, went too far, went too far. Um, at the top of turn four. Oh no. Sorry, I'm putting the cart before the horse. Here we go. Um, Riptide scooted this way, Riptide came forward, Riptide scooted back. The reason the two and Riptide comes back is because he wants me to come forward to try to finish it, which puts me into ultimate 
Cal Yan range of all of these guys. So exploding fives going into turn four, which will basically be the end of my army if I get hit by that. Um, and aside from that, he moves his Delphish here really cleverly, so Magnus can't move around the cargo container to, to not see it. He can't move around this way in the cargo container and not see it. It's always going to be closest. So I got to deal with this Food Shaper and the Delphish. And this is the kind of resources Siegs really doesn't mind using. He outflanks some Pathfinder Breacher people here. Pathfinder Breacher people over here. No problem. Whatever. Um, largely speaking, he just spent his turn killing Terminators and putting some chip damage on Fate Weaver. He's down to 14, it looks like, instead of the healthy 22 he wants to be at. So, what do I do from here? Points projection-wise, we're still on track with all of our 8s, right? Um... Like, at, well, as I score my turn, I have three eights. I've killed a couple more units in Siegs. There's some units exposed for me to kill, so I can get some bonus primary that way. Siegs has just killed the Terminators, so he's about to score some points there. But still, I've, I'm up on the kill battle. I get grinding down. I don't get grinding down this turn because I only killed... I killed the two drones and the Shaper, so I do get grinding down this turn, which is great. So I'll get marked in just a second. Banners is even. Decisive action just goes to 12. War Pitchel just goes to 12. So... Literally, primary is more or less even. What I'm making up for in minutia, like I have a couple extra kills over Siegs, he's going to make up for one bottom turn. Raise the banners. Just raise the banners. We're, we are drawing until we're not. Decisive action is a 12. Warp Ritual is going to be a 12. It's not there yet, but it will be. So it's really going to come down to a Boar of the Witch versus grind them down or some fundamental shift in how the game is being played. So we're on t going to turn four. I don't know how much more we can shift how the game is being played. Because basically, my thought process is if I go from here to this position, have Magnus come in through the only gap he can because his options are this way or that way. This way doesn't do anything. He literally can't see this Riptide. He doesn't have range for that Riptide. That was something Seek's checked. So what he can do is come over here and deal with this. And that's so uninspiring it hurts. I can do that while pushing up with horrors, and maybe this was the move I'm supposed to make. We'll see what I mean by that. Fate Weaver here can come up, probably try to blast this two in Riptide, try to charge this Riptide, and maybe we kill two Riptides. But then we've got the Kalyan rebuttal of Crisis Suits, this Riptide who's really going to be undamaged. Cold Commander, Commander... Breacher slash, actually, this is a Pathfinder team, and this is a Pathfinder team, and the game actually played. It's Breachers on the list, which is why I keep saying that, but these are Pathfinders. And all these units that I've circled here are basically going to have their choice of Lasting Fate Weaver or Magnus in Cal Yon and being like fives to hit. Explode. Re-roll. Hits. I'm playing Tau. You are dead. And Richard has the two CP stratagem to ignore invulnerable saves because he's playing Borkan, which I've... Try to mitigate the effectiveness of by not giving him stuff to shoot at that doesn't have awesome armor or the demonic save of Fate Weaver. I used Perplex in my last turn to actually keep it so that uh, his healthiest Riptide couldn't shoot Magnus in the way he wanted for whatever it was worth. And Magnus didn't take damage last turn, so I guess that. But now I'm in this predicament, right? Like if I go for it, I'm not going to be able to take Richard off of this objective either way with Fate Weaver, because these Christ suits are on it. Here I could reasonably take him off, but it wouldn't affect his primary, because he's going to hold this objective, this objective for eights. It would tear down a banner. So I could take a banner advantage, but I give up basically a Boar the Witch in terms of Magnus, and I basically throw grinding down into the trash can as, a, as an option. So I decide that's not the move, um, and I decide to retreat. This is where I'm really unsure, and we'll get into my takeaways. The horrors came forward. They took down the banner because there was no obsec here. So I just moved forward and took down the banner. I actually raised the banner. I uh, didn't even have to. You can actually raise the banner when your opponent has one there if you control it. Silly. Um, so that's what that little yellow, uh, goldish marker is, me raising a banner. I was hoping that my horrors, because they're trailed back to behind this wall, could basically live through Sieg's turn. Um, essentially take damage, take damage, take damage as he shoots, split, 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 and then take minus side away from him. So I was hoping I can get that kind of thing off to essentially get grind them down 
where I wouldn't otherwise have it. Because I was able to kill this guy. Oop, oop, he's just dead. That's a unit kill. And uh, I retreat, I move these noise marines, or these rebirth marines up in there to help those harlots out because they're going to take a lot of damage this turn. Magnus retreated, Fate retreated. This dude came forward, uh, getting within three of the horrors, um, and he was the dude who extended his range to kill that, and that is my grind and downplay. This dude got Warp Ritual off for seven. So really, really, really janky turn for Thousand Suns here. Infernal Master ran forward, extended his range 24 to kill a Crude Shaper to get me the grind and down. Because again, this game is coming down to very little minutia here. I tear down Seeks' banner, raise my own, so I'm hoping to get, create a little advantage, finish my warp ritual with this guy. I'm hoping that I'm in a position that I'm not really getting struck back. I also go for uh, a temporal a cult of manipulation play here where I slow down. I believe the Riptide, maybe it was the Crisis Suits, but we'll see how it all unfolds. Richard's turn four. He's now taking the opportunity to get aggressive because the game is coming to an end. And uh, he sees that, you know, my tactic is to run away and take a slightest points lead I can possibly get. So he's just moving forward. Devilfish is catching the smite screens. Riptide's Crisis Suits coming forward, coming out. Pathfinder's coming out. Dumpsters my horrors into the next dimension, brings them down to a two man. And you'll notice that I have two guys kind of in the open here. Um, I don't remember how the casualties worked out, but I have horrors here. And that's what's important. It's the end of Richard's turn. This cold star teleported, and then this riptide moved and then strike and faded to get in front of him. So that's a big problem. We're going into my turn five. So Richard's now exposed himself, but he, with this maneuver, killed my shaman. Killed my Infernal Master. Tore this banner down. And while I still have an 8, my nice points projection has come to an end. Because Richard has scored 8 points on the board of the Witch. And I was trying to beat that with my grind him down. He also got rid of my grind him down, which I was looking for yet again um, by trying to snipe out that, that Shaper with my Infernal Master. It didn't work. I missed grind and I got my Infernal Master killed. So instead of me getting three points, I gave him three points. So that was a huge, not blunder, it's very hard to see that kind of line, but did not work out for me. This is basically where we ended. Um, I took the, turn, the best turn I could take. I teleported Fate Weaver over here and I tried to kill as many as I could for grind. Magnus came out this way. Um, I basically killed the two-wound Riptide that was back here in another unit. On the objective, Magnus came out this way, smited the Riptide to death, and then failed his charge onto the Cold Star Commander after Richard used 2 CP to um, make me feel charged. These horrors came out again, preventing Richard from raising a banner once more. So I'm actually winning the banners battle, and as you can see, my banners ends on a 13, his ends on a 12. So I did win that one. Uh, decisive Action and Warp Ritual are all 12s, just as we anticipated. Primary 88886 eight, eight, for a clean 38 finish for me. 8883. Eight, eight, he actually could get a 12 on the end of the turn, but we called it here because he'd already won. So, primary more or less a draw. I'm up three on here. He gets four more points on turn five. A board of the Witches is an eight, grinding down is a three. And this is before Richard takes his turn where he could try to get even more. So, he's, he's won already at 77 to 76. So, very great game. Very high level, high, highly analytical. Where did it go wrong? So, final thoughts is my army struggles to. With screen clearing outside of Smite, I really thought I could get better reserve manipulation when I come in. So unfortunately, by design, my army takes Magnus and Fabio by like list premises. And this means I'd really throw control out the window. Whereas if I had way more infantry and more characters in the traditional sense I could hide, I had a points advantage. And I was able to, I could have been able to lean into it, lean into it. You took grind them down and or I took you, you took aboard the witch. It's a zero, because I'm sitting behind my castle. Um, you took mission primary kills, whatever. I'm killing stuff from out of line of sight, basically, with smites and, and whatnot. So, and then teleporting out to safety. So because I wasn't able to effectively clear screens to create a drop, and because my list's identity is one that is forced to get aggressive, and that's because I think Thousand Suns in today's meta, need to get a little bit more aggressive to solve their problems. It just happened to be that this game, I wanted to play like a control match from an army nature standpoint. I wasn't really able to play aggressive in there because of the deep striking screen problem. So rather than looking at this as like, I wish I could turn my control ability a little bit better, which, you know, that would have probably won this game. 
Um, it'll create bigger problems down the line in other matchups, right? Losing control matches to all kinds of armies. So this is more about how I can make Magnus now. I can make Fate Weaver have a better drop turn. The three main flamers were a bit of a grind them down liability. Kind of late, later, you know, I got three on grind them down. I went first. I thought my army would be pretty good at grind, especially because he's all these little trashy four man crews, solo shaper, etc. He played phenomenally well. Nothing I can really say about that. But if I'm going to make grind them down a plan, which I really am trying to do, I need to really seriously evaluate am I taking three main flamers and stuff. Or maybe I reconfigure the army and go for engage in all fronts and take like multiple Zangor and Lightning and go kind of that route. That might be better altogether. And ultimately the big decision point where I think I'm not feeling confident, that's a big thing. Like it's not my list at this point. It's me. I'm not confident in my tempo. Let me be specific here. This turn where I to bottom of turn three after Seek Shami, I don't think I should have, I'm not, I'm not sure I should have ran away because it basically led to me losing a control match when my army's not meant to play in control match. I think maybe I should have leaned into it. If I was going to lean into it, maybe I'd lean into it over harder. So like these horrors, if I have two units of horrors and one is on this objective, one is on that, or one, one is in front of these terminators here really, um, and one is pushing up even further, then the terminators aren't getting cow yawned on. The horrors are, the horrors take forever to kill. If they don't get killed, I can go continue to raise and disrupt banners. This is obviously horrors are great into Tau, because Tau only shoot. Um, but, but by having more forward elements here, by playing the situation better, um, putting these this unit of horrors that I have, or even taking a second one and putting it in a more useful spot, having them be the people who charge into tear down this banner one turn earlier, keep Kalyan off of my monsters. At that point, I can actually survive the firepower long enough to get into Seek. So I think if I'm going to play it aggressively, I've got to build it a little more aggressively. And that's really my takeaway here. So it's like, it's, it's a bit of user error. I think I played my army wrong in terms of tempo. Um, but if I'm going to pick an aggressive style like this, maybe I need to forget grind them down because that's a very control-based tempo style. Maybe I go for engage altogether, and that's just a that's just a mental switch I have to flip with my army. And along the lines of engages behind enemy lines, and that's a great secondary as well. So a lot of takeaways I have from this match. Hopefully you enjoyed this strategy session. I had a blast teaching it to you as always. Um, revisiting this game, I actually learned quite a bit. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Let me know what you think if you like this kind of session uh, in the comments below and on the YouTube channel. Leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, like the video. If you're not a War Room member yet, I don't know what you're doing. You get tons of content just like this. We analyze our mistakes. We teach you how to do better. Um, we got John with his 10-minute tips teaching you all the tactical nuances. Stiegs and his advanced strategy sessions go through all the big brings that he's thinking. Jack Snacks killing everybody in the games. You got, we got it all. We got it all. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. We'll catch you later.